Okay, good. All right. Uh, good day, and thank you for joining us for our Small Acres webinar on poisonous plants in Colorado. This webinar is made possible by the Small Acreage Program, which is funded through the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service and Colorado State University Extension. My name is Jennifer Cook. I'm the Small Acreage Management Coordinator for the Front Range here in Colorado. And joining me today is T Dr. Tony Knight, the CSU Clinical Science Professor, um, who has a wonderful presentation for us on poisonous plants. Before I turn things over to Tony, I'd like to um, remind you that if you have questions or comments during the presentation, you can use your chat box on the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Just type it in and hit enter, and we'll be able to correspond in that way. Um, Tony has asked that you um, that we hold. I guess Tony will wait to the end of the, his presentation to answer the questions. But as you come up with your questions or comments, feel free to type them in, so you don't forget about them. Um, let's see. So finally, before I turn things over to Tony, let's pull up that survey question just to get an idea of people's knowledge and understanding of poisonous plants. Um, if you can just use your mouse and click on um, no knowledge, some knowledge, or very knowledgeable as you see it, uh, as you see your understanding of poisonous plants. So we'll give you a few moments to do that. Okay, so everyone looks like some knowledge is the pretty common answer. All right, so we'll load up Tony's presentation and turn things over to him. Good, thank you, Jennifer, and I'm uh, indeed pleased to see uh, we've got um, at least 44 people online and hopefully more will join us. And uh, this information will hopefully be available in the future off the Extension website and also off my webpage if you want to look at it in the future. So. The challenge today is to talk about uh, poisonous plants of Colorado and uh, what are the risks to our livestock um, and the get this thing to move. Click on that for the first one. Oh, the first one. Please. Okay, thank you. All right. So I uh, I saw one question about can we address uh, issues relating to camelids. Uh, I certainly will bring that in, but uh, let me start off by saying that most of the plants I will cover will affect all our common domestic species to some degree, uh, some more than others. But um, horses and llamas, alpacas kind of fit together. They seem to s experience the same problems, whereas the ruminants um, have a... Uh, slightly different approach to how they handle and respond to poisonous plants. So before I get into the individual plants, I'd like to just reiterate some of the obvious factors perhaps that uh, predispose animals to poisoning. And the picture you see there is, is a pasture that has been severely overgrazed. Uh, in uh, contrast to the one in the bottom right, where there's obviously green grass and vegetation. And putting animals um, on that overgrazed pasture will predispose them to eating anything they can get, especially if they're hungry. So lack of forage, uh, the time of year, um, if it's a dry year, obviously there's going to be a greater demand to eat anything that's there, and uh, so the, the problem with poisoning is, is more prevalent. Uh, putting new animals, bringing them from out of state and putting them in a new pasture can uh, predispose to uh, more, po more poisoning. And I put snow cover there because, uh, and I'll mention a bit later in the talk, that um, snow can cover up uh, the basic grass vegetation and uh, may force animals to browse on plants. Uh, that can be poisonous. So uh, we can see poisoning at a variety of different times or under different circumstances. <clears throat> now you look at that pasture there and you say, you know, what's the risk? All those yellow flowers uh, are uh, senecio or groundsel, and, uh, you know, that horse out there, would that 
animal eat that plant at this point? Probably not. There's enough other vegetation around, and uh, animals tend to be uh, choosy in what they eat, and uh, even if they do have a mouthful or two, it's not going to be catastrophic or cause any problems. So, again, overgrazing, overstocking a pasture can predispose to poisoning. Let's not forget that um, we can see plant poisoning at any time of the year in the middle of winter, especially since many of our plants that are poisonous remain so even when dry and put up in hay. So you can get animals uh, showing signs of poisoning just from eating hay in the middle of winter. The, the bottom picture there shows some horses feeding out of a, uh, a tank and the hay is dumped in the middle. And we sometimes see a horse uh, like the one on the right, uh, the white horse, who's a bottom feeder, likes to clean up all the, the chaff that's in the bottom. And um, again, pieces of plants, uh, toxic plants, uh, tend to congregate there. And this particular animal may be hungry and cleans up all the, uh, uh, the chaff at the bottom where the toxic seeds and so forth accumulate. Moral of the story is clean out your feed bunks on a regular basis so this does not allow accumulation of these toxic products. <clears throat> this little saying, it is the dose that makes the poison, is, is very critical to uh, understanding uh, poisoning. I hope that when you get done with this seminar, you don't uh, immediately think you have to get your roundup out and go out and nuke every plant uh, that isn't grass out there. It's uh, rarely necessary. I will point out one that is highly poisonous in, in a minute. But in a uh, normal situation, even if a, cattle, a, a cow or a horse eats a mouthful or two of a poisonous plant, um, they rarely get enough of the toxin to cause any permanent damage. So the, the dose makes the poison is all, is all critical. <clears throat> The other uh, important thing to realize is animals respond differently. Uh, sheep and goats are particularly adaptable to um, eating poisonous plants. In fact, we use them many times as biological controls. Uh, cattle probably see more poisoning than anything else. They tend to be voracious eaters that consume a large amount of plant into their rumen. And uh, this, again, is the dose that becomes a, a toxic factor. Horses, alpacas, llamas, and so on, they tend to be more uh, finicky eaters and, uh, again, assuming they're not starving, um, are not prone to as much uh, risk as are some of the ruminants. The dose makes the poison. I keep emphasizing that. Uh, a band of sheep like this, for example, even if there's plenty of poisonous plants out there, the, this number of animals is going to eat the plants that are there and in the process get a minimal amount of toxic plants just because of sheer numbers. So when you look at that sort of mob of animals, they are a great biological control for cutting down or eating weeds that um, could uh, devalue the, the, the pasture or property. So... Um, to summarize uh, the, the, the toxicity of plants, um, toxins vary at the, uh, at the uh, stage of growth of the plant. Um, we can see uh, that dose vary where uh, plants growing in shade versus sun, uh, whether they're well uh, uh, got enough hydration or whether they're droughted. Uh, we can see it. Uh, we can see variation in toxicity amongst animal species. We've mentioned overgrazing and drought. Uh, one thing you may not realize is if you spray plants with herbicides, you may actually increase the palatability of the plant, and therefore animals would tend to uh, eat it because it tastes better, especially with increased levels of nitrate in the plant. And last but not least, we've mentioned again if, if an animal's hungry it's going to eat things that it would not normally do so and increase the risk for poisoning. I'm going to focus mostly on poisonous native plants. 
Um, they, in fact, are the more poisonous um, group of plants in contrast to the noxious um, weeds that are listed by the uh, state of Colorado and various other states uh, as invasive. But um, a lot of our poisoning actually results from uh, some of our common native plants. So let's take a look at some of these as we go along. And we'll start off with a uh, catastrophic scene, which is obviously uh, uh, finding a dead cow out in your pasture or a dead horse, dead llama, whatever. And uh, that is always very disconcerting and, and uh, prompts a, a quick uh, response, if we can, to figure out what's going on. So, the most common fatal poisoning uh, plant in Colorado is the larkspur. Uh, larkspurs are native plants. There are large numbers of them in uh, uh, different species across North America. We have uh, six or eight of them in Colorado. Um, and I think many of you are familiar with them. Uh, it won't be long now before they'll start blooming along the foothills and out on the prairie. And uh, probably another month or so up in the high country. Larkspurs literally cause more problem to ranchers and cattle in, in uh, Colorado than anything else. They come in uh, a variety of uh, growth forms. We commonly refer to the tall larkspurs uh, that occur up in the high country, usually in where aspens grow. You often find these, uh, these plants. They're perennials, come back every year. Uh, they may grow up to five, six feet in height and are considered, all, all species are considered poisonous. In the foothills, uh, in fact, the entire intermountain area has a variety of different species, but uh, the foothills and out on the prairie, uh, there are lower growing species, may only grow 12, 24 inches high, and uh, these are also equally poisonous. And... Uh, we, just depending where you are, you will find uh, different groups of uh, larkspurs growing. Larkspurs contain a variety of alkaloids, complex alkaloids, that uh, act on the nervous system to cause paralysis. In fact, they act very similar to uh, curare, the arrow poison from South America. And uh, it actually then causes the animal to collapse and become paralyzed and die from the effects of the alkaloids. The tall larkspur is probably in Colorado the most problematic, most poisonous, and they tend to be most poisonous uh, right before flowering when they're actually elongating their flower spikes. And the other interesting uh, fact is that cattle are very susceptible to larkspur poisoning. Horses and alpacas are somewhere in between. Um, Rarely are they fatally poisoned, whereas sheep can eat it with uh, relative impunity. They, they actually can be used as a biological control. And they will graze it down and not suffer any uh, uh, toxic effects. So what we see in larkspur poisoning, uh, unfortunately many times is just a dead animal because the uh, alkaloids act very acutely and the animal collapses. Uh, has difficulty breathing because it cannot uh, belch or eructate normally. It tends to bloat up and that compounds the uh, difficulty in breathing and so they die quite rapidly from it. So it can be a cause of an unexpected or sudden death um, in Colorado. It is treatable, um, and uh, but in in reality it's, it's uh, how do we manage all the animals that go up in the high country, the ranchers send up there in the summer, or if you have property that has the plants growing on it, how do we work around it? After all, we can't spray the intermountain area with herbicides, and nor do we want to. And uh, there's been some good work out of Logan, Utah, by um, Dr. Fister and Ralphs and others over there, uh, looking at when, how do we manage larkspur. And what they found was, as this graph uh, shows, is that the, uh, the plant, when it first comes up in the spring, is uh, 
not very palatable. The animals don't like to eat it much. Uh, but fortunately, that is when it is most poisonous. So they're not eating it at this stage. Then as the season goes on, the toxicity declines. And uh, by the end of the season, it's relatively non-poisonous. Whereas um, during the same period, the animals tend to like to eat it more. So by the time it gets to the end of the season, uh, they'll eat a lot of it. But at that point, of course, it's, it's much less poisonous. So we now know that if we can identify the plant before it flowers, we take the animals out of that area or pasture until it is past the flowering stage, when it's going into the seed pot stage. And then we can reintroduce the animals to that range and make use of that type of uh, uh, natural rangeland and without having to use herbicides and so forth. If you've got a neighbor who's got lots of sheep and goats, you may be able to talk them into uh, grazing some of your pasture for the little larkspur in it. And uh, again, they work very well as a biological control. <clears throat> Treatment. Um, if you're having problems with this, consult with your veterinarian. Uh, Physostigmine is a specific antidote that reverses the paralysis that these uh, larkspur alkaloids cause. Uh, again, it has to be given early on before the animal collapses and uh, it uh, needs to be uh, administered either intravenously or intramuscularly by injection. All right, um, so much for larkspur. Another plant, and uh, this is probably the most poisonous plant we have in Colorado. Larkspur kills lots of animals. But milligram for milligram, uh, this particular plant is the most poisonous. It's a native plant again. Uh, some of you may recognize it quite easily in your pasture because, uh, as you can see, it's early spring and this bull is dead. The willows here have not even leafed out yet. Uh, but it's easy to recognize because usually right in the ground beside the plant, you'll find a, uh, a uh, there it is, a knife sticking in the ground beside the plant. So uh, you should have no trouble. But in case you do, then what you hope to see is the plant in bloom. And uh, this plant, some of you may recognize, is water hemlock. Uh, it likes to grow in marshy ground and um, has these uh, terminal clusters of white flowers and um, these are the typical leaves that you see uh, in the, the, around the base of the plant here. If you pull on the plant, it'll often come up because it's in wet, soft ground, and you can see the tuberous, finger-like growths. It has hollow stems, and if you split the stem with a pocket knife, uh, you'll often see this yellow fluid that... Um, comes out of the cut stem, and this is the highly toxic uh, uh, cicotoxin in the plant. Again, uh, those of you who tend to smoke different leaves, make sure you know your leaves, because uh, smoking this particular kind of leaf could be your last cigarette. So, uh, water hemlock, members of the Cicuda family. Uh, there are four species in North America. The one we have most commonly is uh, in Colorado is Cicuta maculata. And um, this plant is highly poisonous to all animals, including people who might mistake the roots for a wild parsnip. And uh, it only takes an ounce or two of the plants to kill a thousand pound animal. The roots are the most poisonous. And this alcohol, this cicotoxin, is present in all plants, particularly the roots, and uh, is rapidly absorbed and causes uh, total paralysis of the uh, respiratory system and, of course, causes acute death um, as a result of this. There is no treatment or antidote that uh, is specific against this toxin, and so we need to focus on uh, removing it from our pastures. Uh, this is the one plant 
that I would recommend that, that you remove because it only takes an ounce or two of the new leaves and roots to kill a thousand pound animal. And here's a good pasture scene uh, that I came across out in the western part of the state where uh, these horses were turned out in a pasture with nothing but water hemlock, the white flowers you see here. And why are they not dead? Well, the reason again comes back to they've got plenty of other grass to eat. They don't preferentially go over after the toxic plants. And so uh, hopefully they were, will be removed from that pasture before they graze all the grass away and are forced to eating the, the water hemlock. Now, I mentioned water hemlock is a native plant. Uh, we also have another hemlock in Colorado. It's called poison uh, or even European or spotted hemlock. This is a noxious weed uh, introduced from Europe. Uh, unfortunately, it's spread pretty well across North America. And um, people have grown it thinking it was Queen Anne's lace. It'll grow about six feet tall. And um, it's a prolific seed producer. So once you get it on your property, it's going to keep spreading. And you need to remove it before it goes to seed to avoid it spreading. Now this famous painting um, is of course uh, uh, Socrates and he was executed be, by being forced to drink a concoction of poison hemlock. And uh, so this plant has been around a long time. Uh, of course it is the name given to the Hemlock Society Again, relevant to the uh, Socrates and his him being poisoned uh, form of execution. So, part, uh, spotted hemlock, as you can see um, on the stems, we have these nice red spots. It helps it quite uh, helps us identify it quite readily. It has carrot-like leaves, and if a cow is to eat the whole plant. Um, or the whole root, then it could kill her. It's not as poisonous as a uh, as the water hemlock, but uh, nonetheless, it can be fatal. The other interesting fact is that if the cow is pregnant and she is browsing on the on the hemlock without actually eating enough to kill her, it will cause a uh, deformity in the uh, developing fetus. And you can see these deformed uh, hooves and legs. Uh, the bones are deformed and they can't walk. So obviously this is costly to the producer as this animal is not likely to be able to survive on the, on the range. So it does affect the fetus uh, and uh, causes uh, losses in that sense. Again, there's no treatment for poison hemlock toxicity. Plant that I think many of you are familiar with is uh, milkweed. Uh, there are again many species of milkweed that grow in North America. They are native plants and are so named after the, the Greek god of healing, Asclepius. And um, it's been known for a long time that these plants have a variety of, of medicinal uh, properties. And again, depending on how much is eaten, can cause uh, fatal poisoning. Uh, I think we're all familiar with the milkweeds. Uh, the common ones, the big showy milkweeds, have these pink flowers. Uh, there's others that have white flowers and don't grow much more than six inches high, the dwarf plains milkweed. Uh, and the other thing we often know about it is that this is the favorite uh, plant that the monarch butterfly likes to lay its eggs on for the caterpillars to feed on. So it's actually uh, an important uh, uh, part of this insect's life cycle. Interestingly, the insect has adapted to be able to absorb the toxin into its tissues, and so it's a, the toxin serves to protect the butterfly from insects and birds and so on because of the, of the toxicity. In our animals, uh, Milkweeds, uh, if eaten in enough quantity, will kill uh, animals quite dramatically. Uh, it is um, probably only takes a pound or two of the uh, leaves. 
and uh, we can, they're particularly poisonous when it's green, but it's also poisonous you see out in this pasture uh, where this farmer turned out his, um, his uh, recently purchased animals, all this brown uh, vegetation out here has actually dried up milkweed at the end of the summer, and it's still poisonous at that uh, stage. The uh, important thing to remember about milkweeds is the narrow-leafed varieties that are poisonous, not the broad-leafed kinds. You see the broad leaves, as you see here. These are still poisonous, but no uh, self-respecting animal will eat those unless they're starving to death. However, the narrow-leafed ones, as you see here, these are grass-like leaves. Uh, both plants have a milky sap similar seed pods and so on, but it's these narrow-leafed ones that are highly poisonous and uh, cause most of the uh, poisoning that we encounter. The milkweeds contain uh, digitalis-like glycosides, uh, so therefore they act on the heart, cause cardiac irregularities, they even stop the heart, and of course the animal dies. They have to eat a fair amount, about 2% of their body weight, and uh, where we see problems is when these narrow-leafed species get incorporated in hay. And uh, you might have a bale of hay that's half milkweed. Well, that would soon uh, poison an animal if they were hungry to, to eat these leaves. And they tend to be a little more palatable when they're dry than when they are uh, green. And the white milky sap is uh, more irritating to the mouth of the animal, so it uh, deters them from eating it. Um, another native plant is uh, the death camus. This is a well-known plant. It was historically important to the early settlers who came across North America and in some cases had to feed off uh, whatever uh, vegetation they could uh, dig up and eat. And they mistook the uh, wild onion, the bulbs of the wild onion, for the uh, bulb of the death camus, and consequently it uh, proved fatal to those that ate it. So a variety of these native species occur um, across North America. They're certainly prevalent in Colorado, even at high elevation. And uh, they contain a variety of alkaloids that uh, affect especially the heart and the central nervous system, causing uh, respiratory paralysis. And we've had some good uh, poisoning of uh, alpacas because this plant uh, will often come up early spring before the grass greens up and they go around nibbling those nice succulent shoots. Uh, same with sheep and goats and um, it doesn't take too much to poison them. The most poisonous part of the plant is the bulb that occurs underground and uh, if you dig that up uh, and were to eat it, it would be fatal to a human. So a single bulb could be all you need to, to poison a person, a person fatally. Most of the time our animals are not poisoned from the bulb, they're poisoned from eating the, the uh, emerging vegetation in the early spring. <clears throat> so again, death camus, a white flower. The easy way to tell the difference between the onion and the death camus is to smell a crushed leaf or the bulb and if it smells like an onion, it's probably an onion and not a death camus. There is no treatment for death camus poisoning. And um, what we need to do is be able to recognize uh, this plant early on. As I say, it will be emerging now um, in uh, the front range and will be flowering probably uh, by May. And you can see it tends to come up in some areas in quite a number of uh, plants like this and a little patch like that could be a problem to a, an alpaca or sheep that ate all that vegetation. Again, complex alkaloids, uh, but you can see uh, this. these were some uh, death camus that were brought in because the owner had lost an alpaca and they dug up the bulbs to, and brought them in to, for identification, but you can see how they'd all be nibbled off uh, 
by the alpaca, and, and uh, that was sufficient to kill him. So it's an important plant to recognize. Dig it up if you're concerned and dispose of the plant. Um, it's really necessary to have to spray extensively. <clears throat> and here's an unfortunate sheep that uh, had been grazing on uh, death camus, and uh, it was just left in the field where it had died. So it's a lethal plant. It's nowhere near as important as larkspur in terms of total death loss. But uh, in some areas, it can be quite problematic. Some of you have uh, encountered cockleburrs. And uh, the cockleburr is a, uh, a weed, and it uh, becomes quite invasive. Uh, the burrs themselves are a problem in um, dogs, sheep, uh, alpacas, and it gets in the in the hair and the wool, and it mats that, and it's a real pain to have to clean the fleece and so forth with it. However, the toxicity occurs when the plant, the burr itself, germinates. And you can see the burr here, and then it germinates, and uh, these two-leaf stage, the, the cotyledons, as they first emerge, this is when the plant is highly poisonous. You see the plants uh, emerging in the bottom right, and you can get uh, like a mass of these seedlings all germinating and if an animal gets in there and grazes this plant um, it can uh, be fatally poisoned it actually destroys the liver of uh, animals that eat the uh, two-leaf stage the mature plant is not poisonous it's just this two-leaf stage that's toxic Again, no treatment unfortunately once they have gone into liver failure Many people have oak trees um, on their property, and uh, for all intents and purposes, all oaks are poisonous. And uh, the common gambles oak that we have throughout the Rocky Mountain area is, is certainly poisonous. Uh, oaks contain gallotannins, or tannic acid, and uh, this compound will, uh, once absorbed from the, the intestinal tract, causes... Uh, kidney failure. So these animals die from uh, uh, kidney failure. And uh, goats, as we mentioned earlier, there's species variation. Goats can be used to graze oak, and uh, they are not poisoned, whereas cattle are uh, and horses are poisoned by eating the uh, leaves, especially in the spring when the first oak leaves come out and there's little else green around browsing on the uh, oak leaves, um, oak buds, uh, can cause fatal uh, uh, renal kidney damage. I'm going to move away from some of those that kill animals um, more dramatically uh, to those that may affect the digestive system and cause colic and bloating and, and, uh, and can be quite alarming uh, to the animal and to the owner for that matter. First one I'd like to, to mention is something that uh, everyone has, is bindweed. And this one property is a very fine example of a beautiful crop of bindweed and nothing else. And uh, turning animals out here could certainly cause uh, problems. Now the bindweeds contain a variety of uh, alkaloids and actually, we see a lot of problems with the seeds of the bindweed. Uh, when it's put up in hay and it's got the seeds there, and then these seeds accumulate like in the bottom of a feed bunk, and the bottom feeders come along and eat up the seeds, and uh, these alkaloids cause a uh, severe colic. Not necessarily fatal, but will need uh, veterinary intervention to relieve some of the acute signs. Another one that causes colic, or a group of plants that cause colic, are the, uh, the nightshade family. And included in the nightshade family are the are things like tomatoes and potatoes, uh, as well as the true nightshade with the blackberries on it. There are various other nightshades that grow as weeds in Colorado and, and in fact, throughout North America. And these alkaloids actually uh, belong to the group of atropine-like alkaloids that uh, cause the 
intestinal tract to, to slow down and stop. Uh, and consequently, then gas builds up in the intestinal tract, causes a colic, and again, uh, usually not fatal, but uh, will often need a veterinary intervention to relieve the uh, painful symptoms of colic or bloating that may occur. I don't advise people to feed green potato vines or tomato vines to uh, horses or cattle because they can precipitate uh, colic as a result of the alkaloids in the green part of the plant. Again, a few mouthfuls is not a problem, but if they have a whole bunch of vines to eat on, a wheelbarrow load that you pulled out of your backyard, thrown over the fence, that's when you might get uh, enough toxicity. Uh, back to native plants, a typical intermountain scene that you might expect anywhere from New Mexico to Montana. And uh, in some years you, you won't see these plants, in other years they come up in great profusion. And what you're looking at here is a, a massive infestation of loco weed. Loco weeds are present throughout uh, much of the West. Uh, we certainly have a large number of uh, poisonings associated with that, uh, with these plants throughout uh, the uh, intermountain area. Not all loco weeds are poisonous. There's several hundred species. Um, but the ones that we see most commonly are poisonous. Uh, we see quite commonly the white loco, as I showed you in that first picture. Uh, another one that's very closely or very similar to it is the uh, purple loco. Um, and uh, these two uh, plants occur very commonly, especially when uh, there's adequate moisture in the, in the spring, and they will come up um, in great profusion. For a long time, it was assumed that loco weeds were poisonous in of, them, in of themselves. Uh, but we now know that there is actually a fungus that grows in the interior of the plant and it produces a toxin, an alkaloid called swainsonine. And uh, this is the, the substance that causes the problem in our animals that eat the loco weed. Uh, looking at the plant, uh, it does not in any way look moldy. Uh, you can't see the fungus growing on the plant. It's all interior. And in fact, it's a mutually beneficial relationship between the plant and the fungus. Uh, and the plant actually uh, probably grows better with the fungus. Um, under the microscope, you can see the fungus uh, growing in, the, uh, in amongst the cells. And uh, again, you'd have a microscope. Uh, to, you need a microscope to see this. But the plant itself looks nice and healthy. What does it do to our animals? Well, locoism or loco weed poisoning, uh, the word loco means crazy. Uh, so it obviously affects the brain. And uh, particularly horses become totally disoriented, unreliable, unpredictable in their behavior. They'll fall over, uh, walk into things, um, and uh, cause all kinds of problems. They also, uh, if a mare uh, is to eat loco weed during her early pregnancy, then the foal can be born with uh, arthrogryposis, which means that the bones are permanently deformed and, and uh, uh, can cause permanent lameness. So it affects both the adult animal as well as the developing fetus. <clears throat> Uh, loco weeds also have other effects. Uh, they affect uh, fertility in the male. So you can see infertility in rams, in bulls, and uh, probably any male species that were, would be grazing on loco weed for a period of, of weeks in the early spring or summer. Again, not a single mouthful is going to cause the problem, but uh, if they eat 20, 30 pounds of this over a period of days, the uh, cumulative effect of the toxin, the swainsonine, could cause infertility. It's not a permanent change, but it can be uh, certainly costly to um, the fertility of the, of the animals. <clears throat> so loco weed uh, is a, 
neurotoxin that causes abnormal behavior. It can cause deformities in the fetus. And one of the things that uh, one has to differentiate between locoweed poisoning um, is sage poisoning. And of course, we have a lot of sage in Colorado and the, and the West. And uh, sage is only poisonous to horses. Uh, ruminants, alpacas, can eat sage without any problem. Wildlife eat it a lot. They depend on it in the winter. Horses can eat a, a little bit of sage without any problem, but where we see problems is in the uh, early fall and we get a, say, a, a uh, early snowstorm and the sage is the only thing that sticks up above the snow. And uh, consequently, the animal becomes uh, poisoned by eating or browsing on the sage. So a problem for horses, um, we see, uh, again, a sage that becomes a problem in some areas when you overgraze a pasture. This native sage, uh, commonly referred to as fringe sage, can become quite invasive. And again, if that's all the animals have to eat, they, they will develop uh, poisoning. How do we recognize sage poisoning other than these animals act really bizarre and and look like they're loco. The big difference is that uh, with sage poisoning, the breath of the horse smells of sage. The, uh, the, uh, fe the feces smell of sage. So if you have that strong sage sp smell on the breath and they're acting kind of crazy, take them off the sage and they will recover. Unfortunately, in loco weed poisoning, if they are locoed or poisoned, then the damage is permanent to the brain, especially in horses. And uh, there is no treatment uh, for these animals. They, in, in essence, become effective pasture ornaments and not safe to ride um, once they become low code. So here we have a picture of a uh, horse that obviously is in not good body condition. Uh, the owner was not abusing the animal or not underfeeding it. Uh, they tried everything to, to uh, provide any kind of feed it would take. And in fact, the animal would try and eat um, and would hold food in its mouth. Uh, but in the process, of over a period of months here, it was gradually starving to death. And... Uh, Sorry for that interruption, um, a minor technical glitch. Uh, let me back up one slide here just to refocus. We're talking about this animal that had, uh, was having difficulty uh, eating, holding food in its mouth, and why it was doing this is it been, it's been eating on Russian knapweed. This is a noxious weed uh, introduced again from Europe sometime in the past unintentionally and unfortunately it is very aggressive and invasive and has uh, taken over uh, vast areas particularly in the western part of Colorado uh, and is uh, continually spreading. It only affects horses, cattle, sheep can eat it but a horse that is eating this for any length of time will uh, uh, develop this problem that's referred to as chewing disease. The other plant uh, that does the same thing as the Russian knapweed is yellow star thistle. And uh, this is, of course, got these bright uh, green. Just click where you want it to go. Go over here, do no? Okay. Excuse me. These green, uh, these yellow flowers with these big spines on it, the yellow star thistle. Uh, it's uh, primarily a problem in California and Washington. However, unfortunately, it has now uh, made its way across the mountains 
uh, into Colorado, uh, some areas in the western slope and even in some areas in, uh, in the eastern part of the state. And animals eating this plant will undergo a, uh, uh, a permanent brain damage. Uh, the animals can't um, chew and, and, and bite off the food as normal. Consequently, they uh, attempt to chew things and consequently uh, can't and uh, die of uh, starvation. If you look at the brain on these animals at autopsy, they uh, have two very specific areas in the brain that are destroyed by the toxin and in the Russian knapweed or the yellow star thistle. And uh, if you care to impress people, this is referred to as nigropallidal encephalomalacia. Unfortunately, it's permanent. There is no way uh, that we know how to treat this and reverse this process. And consequently, the uh, animals are usually euthanized to avoid them starving to death. People often ask about, uh, what about the other knapweeds? Uh, the common ones are things like spotted knapweed and uh, diffuse knapweed and hybrids thereof. Uh, as far as we know, they are not poisonous to uh, livestock, horses, they're certainly noxious weeds and invasive, but they do not cause the chewing disease like Russian knapweed or yellow star thistle. Uh, photosensitization um, is a problem we see in uh, all our livestock species, and it looks like a severe sunburn, as you can see here. It can affect all the white-skinned areas, whether it's on the legs or the face, and literally the hide uh, dies and peels off like a, a very severe burn. And the two plants that I would like to mention uh, important to us in Colorado are the group of plants called senecios or groundsels. And they contain these pyrolizidine alkaloids. Uh, and they come in uh, usually yellow flowers, uh, emerge in the early spring. Uh, many of them are native to this area. And all of these uh, senecios uh, are should be considered poisonous. And they remain toxic even when uh, incorporated in hay. So uh, not something to have in the hay meadow. The other one that we have a more and more of a problem of in, in the West, and particularly Colorado, is the uh, is hound's tongue. And now this is a non-native. It was an introduced weed uh, many years ago. It is now spreading everywhere. Uh, comes up the first year in a rosette of leaves, as you see here. Uh, and the second year, it then sends up a flower spike. And uh, these plants contain these pyrolizidine alkaloids. It has a red flower, um, as you can see here. And uh, what many of us notice is the burrs that stick to our clothing or to the animal's hair. And Consequently, it, it is spread around quickly by animals uh, transporting the seeds. So what do these plants that contain alkaloids do? Uh, if a horse eats the hay with this plant in it, um, it will, uh, these alkaloids are absorbed from the intestine. They uh, enter the liver. They cause permanent uh, liver damage uh, to the point the liver can't, uh, metabolize this uh, phyloerythrin or chlorophyll, the breakdown product is phyloerythrin. This then accumulates in the skin. And then when sunlight hits the uh, uh, non-pigmented skin, it causes this intense reaction uh, that we see as photosensitization. So when you see a horse or any animal with this kind of white skin sunburning, one has to be suspicious that they are eating plants that are containing these alkaloids. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we don't do liver transplants in our animals too often. And so it tends to be permanent damage. So we see signs of liver disease, weight loss, uh, obviously the skin lesions. Uh, oftentimes you'll see the Whites of the eye turn yellow, the membranes turn yellow, all signs of an underlying liver problem induced by uh, either hound's tongue or uh, the uh, senecio. 
Fortunately, no treatment. Once the liver is destroyed, uh, these animals do not recover and uh, tend to waste away. And again, we tend to euthanize them once we have a positive diagnosis. And you can see a horse here severely photos photosensitized. The, uh, the white skinned areas are affected, whereas the brown pigmented skin is not. Very classical signs of photosensitization. I have to mention selenium briefly. Uh, selenium is an element that we have in the soils here. It's uh, important to normal health of our animals. Uh, throughout the dry, alkaline uh, mid-section of the continent, uh, we have lots of uh, selenium in the soil. And the selenium is important to us because it is picked up by plants, absorbed by plants. In fact, some of them, uh, such as this prince's plume, uh, is only uh, able to grow in, in the West here because selenium is in the soil. It's an obligate uh, selenium accumulator. And, uh, and most of the time, animals won't eat this uh, prince's plume. Uh, it doesn't taste good to them. However, um, it tells us that any of these plants that require selenium, here's another example of a woody aster that must have selenium to grow. We know that if these plants are growing there, that um, the soil contains a lot of selenium, and therefore the grass in that area contains selenium. So as you see this picture here of the cow grazing, the uh, grass out here um, has selenium in it. We know that without even doing testing, because this plant, which happens to be two-groove milk vetch, only grows where selenium is in the soil. So seeing that, walk in your pasture, see that, then you can be suspicious of potentially high levels of selenium. And what does selenium do? Well, it displaces uh, sulfur. Sulfur is critical in the formation of hair and hoof. If you don't have adequate selenium or it's re replaced by selenium, then you get a defect forming in the, uh, the formation of the keratin um, that is the principal protein in the, in the animal's hoof or in the hair. So you get animals with uh, cracks in their hooves. Usually these are horizontal cracks, uh, as you see here. And they usually affect all feet. And many times the hair is broken off in the tail or the mane, giving it these typical uh, lesions. Is a milder case you see here. Uh, eventually, the hoof can slough off and cause lameness, and uh, it's a, a problem we contend with in the West. So circular cracks on the hooves prompts intervention, uh, trying to prevent this. And the easiest thing to do is to uh, provide sulfur in the diet, either in the mineral or the concentrate, uh, along with some copper is always good. And... Uh, the easiest thing to do is incorporate some alfalfa um, in the ration because alfalfa contains uh, large amounts of sulfur. And in, in, in so doing, it counteracts any selenium that might be present in the pasture or the hay that's being fed. I'll end up here in the last minute or two here talking about uh, some other common noxious weeds, uh, specifically leafy spurge. And we're all familiar with this plant. Uh, those of you from Montana probably think it should uh, be the state flower of Montana because it uh, is very prevalent there. Uh, we plenty have, have plenty of it in Larimer County and many counties throughout the state. Its main problem is that it's an invasive noxious weed and it is relatively non-poisonous. Most animals will not eat it because the milky sap in the leaves are, uh, is irritating to the mouth and, and they won't eat it. We've done studies uh, feeding sheep uh, the leafy spurge and uh, they do fine on it. So they can be used as biological controls. Uh, but you can see that it's, uh, this plant spreads by an underground root system and uh, also by seed. So this is one plant that you do not want to uh, 
uh, let become established because it will displace grass, uh, grasses and other veget normal vegetation in the area and become a monoculture, which uh, obviously is not any value to you. So I've been through uh, a variety of plants uh, that are quite common. Uh, if we had a couple more hours, I'd cover uh, some other plants that uh, may be less, are less of a problem, but uh, do occasionally cause poisoning in our animals. Um, so I would recommend that um, as a further resource, uh, you can certainly uh, purchase this book, A Guide to Plant Poisoning of Animals in North America. Uh, written by two very famous authors, and um, you can get it uh, through Amazon or through uh, calling this toll-free number to the publisher directly. Or you can go to my website, uh, as shown here, um, and all these plants and information about them is on that website, uh, in addition to many more plants that uh, may be of interest to you. And certainly my email is on that website, so if you have plants that are of concern to you uh, and you don't know what it is, take a digital image and, and uh, email it to me. I'll ID it for you. Or um, just send me an email and, and I'll see if I can help you. There are some other references I have listed there. Um, and I think with that, Jennifer, we will see if I can answer some of the questions that um, people have uh, sent in and uh, go from there. Okay, sounds good. Um, should we do the poll real quick in case people need to log off? So we'll, we ha Tony said he can stay, you know, for 15 minutes or so or maybe until 1.30. If you guys have lots of questions, we can stick around until... Um, we have answered all the questions, but um, if you have to log off, go ahead and answer our poll question really quickly after viewing the webinar or listening to Tony talk. Um, how do you feel your knowledge is on poisonous plants? Good to see that uh, we've got some experts now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I know who to refer to. <clears throat> All right, it looks like everyone has voted who wants to vote. <clears throat> and then we'll bring up questions. So we had a whole bunch of comments throughout the presentation. Um, do you want me to go through and read the questions and you could just answer them? Yeah, that would be great. Would that be easier? Yeah. Let me just have the mouse. Oh, All right. So I'm just going to stop at, start at the top. Um, I know we had a question about if you're referring to goats, are you also talking about sheep um, w during your talk, or were they kind of yeah? Sheep and goats separately? are often uh, very similar in their uh, um, ability to deal with uh, toxins. Not always, but uh, by and large, sheep can graze larkspur, as can uh, goats, uh, oaks, and this kind of thing. Okay. Um, are the oak acorns poisonous? Are uh, the egg acorns poisonous? Acorns are poisonous. Um, of course, people will say that uh, you know Native Americans have eaten acorn flour. Uh, if you wrap, if you grind up the acorns and cook it, uh, then the toxicity is very minimal. Hmm. So fallen acorns, uh, you know, some years, some trees, some massive amounts of acorns, good idea to uh, rake those up and not leave them on the ground for hungry animals to uh, feast on. Hmm. Okay. Most of these other things were comments. Um, I guess, too, if you, if you have any um, plants that Tony didn't mention that you think are poisonous and you've encountered, um, you can type them in here and, and Tony can do a quick discussion about them. Okay, there was one. There was one question there about camus. Um, unfortunately, common terms can be misleading. Uh, you need to be sure. You need to know the botanic identification of the plant. So, camus in some areas is actually edible. Uh, there is a blue camus that occurs up in Washington, Oregon, has a blue flower. Uh, the, that's actually edible, uh, whereas the death camus has a white flower. 
and uh, is clearly poisonous. Okay. Uh, there was a question about choke cherry toxicity. Uh, choke cherries, all members of the uh, prunus family, are poisonous, and uh, more so for cattle. Uh, ruminants, because their digestive system allows the uh, uh, breakdown of these cyanide glycosides into free cyanide, which causes poisoning. Uh, cyanide poisoning is much less of a problem to uh, horses than it is to uh, uh, our uh, ruminant species, cattle, sheep, and so forth. Here's a question about um, somebody who lives in Nebraska and who has some larkspur, uh, depending on the year. So how much of the plant does it take to cause cattle death? Yeah, the, the plains larkspur is, is a, certainly a poisonous species. They probably, you know, an adult cow, a thousand pound cow, would probably have to eat uh, 10 to 15 pounds of it. Uh, but they, some of those patches, they can get into it and uh, uh, can eat it quite quickly and... Um, so it's, again, not just a mouthful or two. They're going to have to eat some poundage. Um, and I did forget to mention that this webinar is being recorded, and it will be available on the Small Acreage uh, Management website. And I'll send everybody the link to that after today, after we have it posted. Um, it looks like um, we've covered all the questions. Yeah, we got yes, that one. Uh, there's a question here, I think, that milkweed is used as a liver cleanser. Right, but it's milk thistle. It was milk thistle. Yes. Okay, all right, good. Hold on, see if anyone else is. Uh, what about corn husk lily? Mm, um, corn husk lily. Uh, could that be just corn lily? Uh, again, colloquial terms can be confusing, but if it's corn lily, uh, occasionally we get problems with uh, pregnant animals eating this plant. It usually grows in the higher altitudes, and it's a native plant up there, and when they eat it, the developing uh, lamb, uh, calf, whatever it is, develops a... Uh, condition called cyclops, where they only have one eye in the center of the head. Usually it's uh, fatal, but um, that's the only problem I know associated with what I assume is you're referring to as the corn lily. Hmm. Here's one. Is, is buckwheat a problem for sheep or goats? Uh, yes, it can cause photosensitization. Um, Buckwheat, uh, you know, people grow buckwheat often as a cover crop, uh, or they may use it to harvest, uh, you know, the actual buckwheat to make flour from. And animals eating a lot of the green plant can photosensitize. So you'll see burning on the tips of the ears, on the face of the sheep. Uh, the fleece protects the other part of the skin so they don't get exposed to the sunlight. Usually it does not cause any permanent damage. If you take them off the uh, buckwheat, they will recover. Any suggestions for getting rid of water hemlock? Uh, it's fairly easy to dig up. So if you've got a single plant, just take a spade and dig it up and dispose of it. Or you can spot spray it with Roundup. And there's a question here. Some losses were blamed on Plains Larkspur, but they doubt that was it. Um, is there something else that cattle could have eaten? Yeah, Cause that's a death. tough question to answer. I mean, uh, Plains Larkspur certainly kills animals. I'm assuming that there wasn't sufficient there to really be of concern. Um, other plants out there, one, one plant toxicity I didn't talk about today uh, is, is nitrate poisoning. Now, many plants, especially annual weeds, will accumulate high levels of nitrate, uh, particularly in drought years. And uh, so these cattle could have been uh, eating plants high in nitrates, which certainly would cause uh, death of the animal. Without further information, I really can't uh, 
be more specific. But nitrates would be something to be concerned about. Hey, Paula has a question. The flower that was shown at the very beginning, the one with the star-shaped leaves, what was the name of that one? Let me go back. You can forget what that was at this point, but I'll tell you real quickly. Okay. Slide two. The only thing I can think of is the milkweed, because that kind of has a star shape. That one, she says. That is a lupin. Um, the lupin is, a, again, a native plant, a um, member of the legume family, and uh, it, um, is to it, it is poisonous. Again, occasionally we get animals eating it, and it causes uh, fetal deformities in uh, a cow that uh, is eating it while she's in her early pregnancy. Um, is toad flax poisonous? Yeah. Okay. Just okay. to clarify, some Claudia said that uh, the corn husk lily um, is actually corn lily, which is uh, veratrum. And as I said, that uh, causes this cyclops deformity in pregnant animals that are eating the plant. The uh, question is, is toad flax poisonous? No. It's a noxious weed, uh, but as far as I know, no one's shown any toxicity problems. Nothing else yet, but it looks like somebody else is typing. So are oaks and bindweed poisonous in llamas? Uh, yes. Again, uh, depending on how much they eat, uh, but... Uh, yeah, as far as I know, any animal would be affected, um, with the exception of probably the, the goats. Um, in this case, the llamas would act more like horses in terms of their susceptibility. Another question, uh, is lupin toxic in hay? And yes, not as poisonous as when it's green, but um, a lot of hay with lupin in it uh, is not a good thing to feed. All right, we'll hang on for a few more minutes if you want to, if you have any more questions, go ahead and type them in. Looks like no more questions, so I guess we'll end today. If you do have any more questions, um, Tony mentioned you can go to his website, um, and also his email address is on the website. And I'll send out an email to everybody with his website as well as a link to the webinar. Um, and if you have any other further questions, you can always contact me and I'll link you to the right answer to the right person. So thanks for joining us um, and have a great day. Thank you very much.